Why does the American political establishment and intellectual establishment have such a deep investment in, and commitment to creating a fake Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and selling that fakery to the people as the actual man? I think it is obvious why the enemies of Martin Luther King, the historic enemies of Martin Luther King, those who fought Martin Luther King when he was alive, why they today are parading as the champions of Martin Luther King. It is because they wish to destroy the great legacy associated with the name Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The question put to us is where would Martin Luther King, Jr. be on the burning issues of our day, especially the question of repaying the African victims of European aggression, which includes the transatlantic slave trade, plantation slavery, colonialism, neo-colonialism, Jim Crow, police violence and repression, the prison industrial complex, contemporary institutionalized racism. This is on the table. And if we're not talking about these issues, we need to keep our mouths shut, which means that most of us who claim to be experts about black people need to shut up. I'm talking about most of the academics and intellectuals the talking heads on CNN, yes. and forgive me, many of the people that call even on word. Yes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the question, yes, Martin Luther King would have stood for reparations. It's clear in the logic of his life and his statements. The question for us is, can reparations for Africans in the diaspora and on the continent be achieved under the existing political and economic system, by which I mean neoliberal free market capitalism, American empire, the military industrial complex, the system of two-party rule of this nation, the IMF, World Bank, Federal Reserve System, the European Central Bank, and all of the mechanisms developed over the last 500 years by which Europeans and European civilization has achieved and consolidated hegemony and empire. Can reparations be achieved under these conditions? No. Any idea that the movement for reparations can be achieved through a system of gradual political and legal reforms similar to the methods by which we achieve legal equality and citizenship in this country, if you think that's the way reparations is going to come, I think you need to rethink your position.
nor do I think reparations will come about through legal actions directed through the American court system. Nor will reparations be achieved by African Americans in America through the legal political system of the United States alone. The achievement of reparations will require a pan-African effort. A few years ago, a meeting of scholars and experts met in West Africa to consider the question of reparations for African colonialism and neocolonialism. They arrived at the figure of $700 trillion, which is not a great deal of money when you consider it the market in derivatives, this paper that floats all around the world, which burdens the global economy, which in many ways is responsible for this great recession slash depression that a good part of the world is now in. That market is estimated to be $700 trillion. So when the Africans talk about $700 trillion as what Europe, let me put it another way, European capitalism owes to Africa, they are close to an accurate figure. And if that is what these African experts came up with, for a continent of close to a billion people, it is not off the charts to consider just for Afro-America, anywhere from 50 to 100 trillion dollars. And that does not include Brazil, uh, Peru, Bolivia, Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is the magnitude of what we are talking about. Reparations for the crimes of colonialism and enslavement and neo-colonialism and the prison industrial complex and institutional racism, reparations for these crimes would constitute an epoch, a change of epochs. It would be part and parcel of the unraveling of the European system of domination and hegemony. This is what we are talking about, and I think we have to be clear about that. As to Martin Luther King, who I want to say here publicly is one of my two or three heroes of the 20th century and 21st century. So you'll know, number one is W.E.B. Du Bois. You all know how I feel about that. <laughs> Secondly is Martin Luther King, and third, is the great hero, Mumi Abu-Jamal. This is a little bit off King, but just it's part of this whole question of what is leadership. Mumi Abu-Jamal, as we assess his character, his steadfastness, his refusal to be broken by the most ruthless and vicious prisons, prison system in the world. What Mumia has gone through for 30 years makes Guantanamo almost look like Disneyland. 30 years in solitary confinement and not broken. There are many examples in modern history of men and women who led from prison, 
Nelson Mandela and his colleagues on Robbins Island, led from prison. Ho Chi Minh, led from prison. Antonio Gramsci, the Italian, led from prison, ultimately executed. Mumia is unparalleled in modern African-American leadership, and we need to embrace him as such. Black Philadelphia needs to rise up. We have been behind an iron curtain where we have not heard his voice. You go to San Francisco, they've heard his voice. You go to Paris, they hear regularly the voice of Mumia. We don't have our ministers, our church members, our Masonic lodges, our civil rights organization playing the voice of Mumi Abul Jamal. Maybe it's because too many of our leaders are locked in to the corrupt, oppressive system that runs this city. They'd rather, they'd rather get the crumbs off the table of this system here in Philadelphia that is set up to serve Center City Philadelphia, Temple University, as it gentrifies and ethnically cleanses North Philadelphia. Everything from Erie Avenue to Gerard Avenue, from 8th to 30th, to the park. That's who's being served. And I think we need to look at the black church through the lenses of Dr. Martin Luther King. Now, if we want to know who King really was, the speech that sums up his life and therefore is, his legacy to us and our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and generations to come. It is the speech that he delivered a year before he was assassinated in New York. Why I Opposed the War in Vietnam, subtitled, For Time to Break Silence where he says to his critics, he said, I will not make or allow you to butcher my conscience. How can I be for nonviolence here in America and not be for nonviolence in Vietnam and anywhere else that imperialism is waging wars against peoples of color? The second thing that he said in that speech, he said he didn't come to that pulpit at Riverside Church to speak to or criticize North Vietnam or the Viet Cong. He wanted to speak to, as he put it, my own government, the major purveyor of violence in the world. And then he went on to say and ask the question which still resonates and which we must ask, as difficult as it might be in 2012, to all sides running for president of the United States. The question of Martin Luther King and who made America the policeman of the whole world? Your hands dripping with the blood of Africans. Rape. You invented rape as an instrument of war and terror against the captured Africans. Democracy. Like Frederick Douglass said, what to the slave is your 4th of July? you hypocrites. <laughs> so King put his moral case before the world. The world heard King, a 
America looked at King with skepticism. You've gone too far, Negro, boy, nigger. Let's be real. You've gone too far. Who are you to criticize this president who has done more for Africa, African Americans than any president since Lincoln? Now, now, we can get into a whole lot of discussions around this. Lincoln, since Lincoln, Emancipation Proclamation signed as a part of a war policy because white, working class, Irish and German and English no longer wanted to fight, as they say it, a rich man's war to quote, free niggas. And hence, if the North won the war, it was not because of Lincoln, but 200,000 Africans, men and women. Lincoln did not free the slaves. The slaves freed themselves. Johnson is not the author of civil rights. The text of the civil rights legislation was written in the streets of Montgomery, Alabama, the bus boycott. The children's marches in Birmingham, that's the text of the civil rights legislation. It is in the lives of African Americans. But they asked Martin Luther King, how dare you criticize this president? But what were the civil rights leaders and the New York Times editorial page saying? The white liberals, that is. What were they saying? They were saying that expediency, political expediency, the lesser of two evils, we got to reelect this man. means more than moral consistency. Let's be real. When King attacked the war in Vietnam, he didn't just attack that policy. Remember, he talked about a movement beyond civil rights that would attack war, racism, and economic exploitation. For him, it was both a moral crusade and a movement to save the country, and ultimately to save the world from American imperialism. We cannot underestimate this. King would also go on to write a book. And where do we go from here, community or chaos? He calls in that book for the beloved community. America, he said, had become consumed in consumerism, individualism, and rank materialism. Anything change? No. Just gotten worse. A culture that prioritized and put a premium upon things and not human beings. And so the beloved community would be a moral reconfiguration of human society and human relationships. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. There is a fierce urgency of now we must act. These are the foundations of King's liberation theology. King was a Christian, a philosopher, and a theologian. Someone asked about systematic theology. That's what he did his PhD dissertation on, focusing upon the German theologian Paul Tillich. But he was also deeply influenced by a man of his own father's generation, Howard Thurman. 
When King goes to Boston University, Howard Thurman is the dean of the chapel. Howard Thurman was raised by a grandmother who, as a teenager, lived under slavery. The end of slavery came when she was well into her teen years. In, he was raised in Florida. He would go on to become a theologian, and I want to emphasize this, a mystical Christian, which is to say he sought not only the relationship, to understand the relationship of man to man, but man to nature and man to the cosmos. Holistic understanding. We can see King working that out in the practical and day-to-day -day life of the civil rights movement. The last thing I want to say, well, one of the last things, is King's intellectual life at Crozier. We do not know enough about that. I just want to make clear that the backdrop of what, his, what he was studying at Crozier was World War II, Hitler, and the most devastating two wars in human history. And if the logics of World War I and World War II were to, were to continue, humanity would ultimately destroy itself. But World Wars I and World and II were wars that Europeans fought among one another over who would dominate the resources of Africa and Asia. White men fighting one another over the colonial world, especially Africa, that they divided among themselves in 1884. So they, they went into a civilizational, suicidal, set of wars over who would dominate the very people and lands that they had enslaved and colonized. You talk about irony, ambiguity, and contradiction. This is what was going on. But then there was India and there was Mahatma Gandhi, and there was the independence movement. Gandhi says, how do we free India, but also how do we save humanity from European values? Should we adopt their methods and their values to free ourselves? Of course, he said, nonviolent direct action. Through Howard Thurman, King, learns of the Gandhian philosophy of social action and social change. But then there's something else that I don't think King could get from Howard Thurman. King, no, I'm, I know I'm talking a little too long, I'm, I'm gonna get this up. King and his colleagues, King enters, by the way, he enters, he graduates from Morehouse when he's 19 years old, so he's a kid. But he's, he's a prodigy, he's intellectually a prodigy. On the one side, he's still got a lot of play in him, a lot of, you know, he went to Morehouse, black college, they party, you know. But there's something else. He looked at the German church. Hitler rises, the church is quiet. Only a very few churchmen and women stood up to oppose Hitler. One of them, was a guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer had been in Harlem at Abyssinia, deeply influenced by black spiritual life. He goes back, he does not accept the church's uh, acquiescence to Hitler. Ultimately, he and a group of colleagues decide that they must act against Hitler and hatch a plan to assassinate him. They fail. They were not trained assassins, by the way. They fail. Bonhoeffer is arrested, and 45 days before Hitler and the Nazis uh, surrender, Bonhoeffer is executed. King and those have to take this into account and ask the question, how could Christians, under the notion that we do no harm to anyone, 
that we are pacifists. How could the Christian church acquiesce to Hitler? This is where King gets the notion of the fierce urgency of now. Christians are not what Christians say they are. Christians are what they do. Christianity a la King is not the religion of pious and self-important individuals who dress up and go to church, but a Christian is one who acts against injustice. In the And so I want to end on this, the real Martin Luther King. The real Martin Luther King, by any measure, was a revolutionary. There is no question about it. And that's why I think that last speech, the speech that he gives a year to the day before he's assassinated, he gives a speech on April 4th, 1967, he's assassinated on April 4th, 1968, in Memphis, Tennessee, leading, and this is a very interesting way it's usually formulated, I'm going to reformulate it, leading a march of black sanitation workers. Let me just step back, though. Now I have to go to W.E.B. Du Bois, Black Reconstruction in America, his most important work, but one of his least read works. First chapter entitled, The Black Worker. What King called the enslaved Africans were a black proletariat. That word might not sit well with everybody, but I'm telling you what he called them. That's what King was leading. It was not just sanitation workers. That was a part of this mass of black workers. Out of that struggle in Memphis comes the modern version of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. You see people walking around DC 33? That goes back to Memphis. Out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Out of that comes the coalition of black trade unionists and probably the most powerful black labor leader in the country today, William Lucy, directly from Memphis. King was leading this movement of the black working class. 75 to 80% of whom, right now as we speak, live in or near poverty. Some of our working class communities not far from here, go to Strawberry Mansion, 100% unemployed, 100% unemployed. This is what he was leading. The question becomes, what are the solutions to this massive, horrific, historically constituted, rooted in the legacy of a slavery that has never died? Agree with you, Michael. Slavery which has not died, we are still living it. White America is living it. And I can tell you, if we are honest, if we are honest, there are many black people who are thinking and living like we lived under enslavement. You see what I'm saying? And it's not our fault. To resolve this problem, we have to transcend the methods and ideology of the fight for civil rights. 
we are now at the level of the struggle for human rights and reparations. And the question for us, and we have to ask it, even if we will never see it fulfilled, is can human rights for black people and reparations for Africans at home and abroad be achieved under the system, let's call it what it is, capitalism and racism that was built upon the free labor and super exploitation of Africans all over the world? I think Martin Luther King answered it, no. When he talked about the beloved community, no. In other of his last speeches, could America and the economic system of America be sustained? No. The question is, will we have the courage to do what is necessary and to begin to organize for a future that we might not live to see? Thank you very much.